a very interesting case. Ah, sorry, a, a very interesting case study from Libya uh, called municipality-led versus civil society-led participatory public space design Libya case study. Uh, then we will have a presentation uh, for Armenia, Armenia. Uh, from uh, Panagioni, Panagiotis Janetakis called the Participatory Design Workshop Vanadzor Armenia. You will correct me if I will, I'm, I'm telling it wrong later. Uh, and then uh, we have another extremely interesting international uh, case uh, um, called Reinventing Participation in Spatial Planning, Citizen Involvement and Experimentation in the Maya Land Use Plan. And uh, we have uh, with us uh, uh, Juan Carlos, I'm sorry, you have your... your, Jose, your, uh, your Jose, Jose Carlos. Jose <laughs> Carlos. Carlo. Uh, Mota, uh, with uh, the rest of his team, he will uh, explain us more later. So I think that it's a, it's a very uh, interesting uh, panel. We have four different uh, case studies from, from completely different... <laughs> Uh, places of the world. I'm, I'm very happy to, to, you know, to, to host this discussion in this uh, conference. Uh, so without further ado, I'm giving the floor to, you know, the, the, not the actual floor, <laughs> the digital floor uh, to Amélie Dacouré. Amélie? Sorry, I, I didn't have my mic, my microphone on. Uh, yes, so I will present you my work. I have my presentation. Um, I'm supposed to present with uh, well, my, my colleague, my, my supervisor, Liz bordeaux Page, but she's not actually a panelist, but she's here. So if it's possible to make her a panelist, it would be great. Thanks. Uh, so I will share my, do you see my presentation? Uh, yes. And everybody can hear me? It's not full screen. I, I don't yes. know if it's better to make it full screen uh, yes, from yeah. here. Yes, I think it's, it's okay screen. now. It's okay? All right. So, yes, yes. hello everyone. Uh, Lise Bourdeau-Lepage and I will present you our paper project entitled uh, Citizen Participation in Urban Planning, Learnings and uh, Prospects in a Urban uh, Context of Disconnection uh, with Nature. We will focus on the French case. Uh, this work is supervised by, uh, so Liz boulder uh, which is professor of geography at the University of uh, Lyon Free, and, uh, and uh, Jean-Yves Georges, uh, research director at, um, at the French National uh, Center of Scientific Research and conducted by me, so I'm a PhD student in, uh, in geography. So to start, I'll talk about a little bit about the, the context. So climate changes and, uh, and biodiversity crises are closely related. There is a feedback loop between climate and biodiversity crisis. Human activities disrupt uh, biodiversity in cities and uh, urban biodiversity impacts on human everyday life. Consequently, city dwellers' nature experiences is in decline. And this decline is a threat to biodiversity conservation and to city dwellers' well being. Thus, this phenomenon is both a cause and a consequence of biodiversity crisis. Moreover, scholars explain that a better nature experience leads one to a better social accessibility for green urban planning, which integrates plants and animals, and two, has a positive effect on city dwellers' health. So in this context, our question is how it to imagine an urban planning process or an urban planning renewal project the, to, to better consider, to take better consideration uh, of local biodiversity. So to do so, we need to know how ecology and particularly biodiversity is introduced during a participatory process related to a standard urban project in France. Conventionally, we also need to know how participation process are introduced during ecological district production, which is the most ecological and green urban project model so far in France. Relying on this diagnostic, we will propose a new participatory uh, model in order to improve nature experiences and indirectly well-being. So first, 
we will identify existing links between participatory process and ecology during standard urban project production. We use to do so, we use three results of a survey we conducted in November. Then we will analyze green district participatory process. And finally, we will identify a relevant way to improve nature experiences during green district project process. Sorry. So the French town planning code provides at a national scale for public participation and consultation that applies for every urban project. Planning documents established at a local stage, this is local scale this time, are trying more and more to add green goals or prohibition to protect natural green spaces on the model of green districts. So to obtain a better vision of ecological issues integration in participatory process during standard urban project, we conducted a survey on expert opinion from October 29th to November 11th, uh, 2021. We gathered 116 expert answers. So the question, according to you, are ecological issues discussed during participation process, almost 58 uh, percent answered often, almost 22 percent responded rarely, and 20.2 percent responded always. So one can notice that the proportion of individuals who uh, indicated rarely is almost the same as those who noted always. So there is a room for improvement, but will this improvement bring benefits? Well, to the question, according to you, does introducing ecology during participation meetings have a positive impact on the process, on the participation process itself? itself almost 17% of our participants said no, and 83% said yes. So there is a positive feedback loop between ecology and participation. Ecological issues seems to be considering, even if, as we said earlier, um, there is a room for improvement. What kind of path should this improvement take and on what fields of ecology should we focus on? We have decided to center on our interest on local species, local fauna and flora, which are major uh, protagonists of the ecological system. So we asked, uh, in the city where you work, do you think that local biodiversity preservation is a major concern for its inhabitants? 41.6% of our participants said no. 58.4% said yes. This result reflects the fact that there are in cities other important issues, uh, such as work conditions, cost of rent, mobility, local biodiversity, um, waste management, security, etc. Nonetheless, local biodiversity uh, preservation is more and more a concern, uh, according to experts. But to be completed, uh, this specific result uh, should be compared to inhabitants' uh, direct uh, opinion. Now we propose to reverse our approach uh, and to understand how participatory process are included in green district in order to complete our analysis of the link between ecology and participation. So by regulation, those kinds of districts must integrate public participation and elements of nature. From 2009, the first Grinnell laws promotes green district conception. Also in 2009, the Green District National Competition started. And in 2012, a National Green District Club and a label of four steps associated to a 20 engagement charter are created. By green districts, we mean all districts engage in the green district label process or competition. There is a total of 287 green districts today engaged in the label process. So all literature research on the presence of nature in green districts reveals that nature experiences are theoretically more important in green districts than in other districts of city due to the regulation mechanism. There is an obligation indicated in the 20 engagement green district charter to integrate green spaces and biodiversity. There's also vegetable continuity and other green corridors are consistent with intercommunal inter planning documents. But uh, what does literature tells us about participation process in green districts? Well, participation is qualified as a major 
element in the National Green District Charter. It appears that public meeting is a theater stage with several actors. So you've got professional agrarian planning or architecture, representatives of co-ownership or tenants, community agents, inhabitants, associative representatives, neighborhood council representatives, and activists. So according to NES, there are six categories of inhabitants' knowledge mobilized during participatory, participatory process. Individual knowledge of use based on proximity and experiences, individual professional knowledge, and this knowledge comes from people who are working in urban planning or urban design, individual activist knowledge, uh, this kind of knowledge is often developed during an associative activity, and collective knowledge of use, which are individual knowledge of use debated and confronted, collective technical expertise. This is when inhabitants with a professional knowledge, so planners or architects, uh, translate a technical language to other inhabitants so they understand the project complexity. And collective activist knowledge. So that's, for instance, pulling off individual um, capacity of uh, poli for political mobilization. So as you see, all those knowledge interoperate together. Now, according to Zetlawi Léger, three types of inhabitants participatory process exist. There is type C. So in this type, uh, inhabitants involvement is not very important. There is a, mostly a, an informative mode. Um, the, type, the type B, uh, inhabitants involvement is more important than usual, but there is, for instance, new arrangements are created uh, to, create a, a, to create an appropriation feeling among people. And there is the type, type A, and type A is, the, is the when people are um, involved uh, during uh, the whole process. Uh, there is a specific arrangement, for instance, uh, workshops, and, uh, and um, inhabitants contribute to definition of urban plan or patterns. So as Tozzi uh, wrote, participation respond to uh, pacification issues. But nonetheless, in every type of participation process, participation reveals its limits. So the risk of adaptation and inclusion, low representation of the less fortunate during public meetings, people lack of interest, uh, the importance of neighborhood identity, so this is of your own opposition, own opposition to a change in general. Um, and when Westland are transformed uh, in new districts, in new green districts, participation is conducted without the, the district inhabitants. Uh, so this reality may cause a problem of legitimacy. So another challenge is to lift these uh, limits we will try to focus on people's lack of interest. We saw uh, earlier that the integration of ecological issues during participation process has a positive impact on the participation process itself, according to 83% of participants of our survey. Uh, that local And that local biodiversity preservation is a major concern for inhabitants, according to 50. 8.4% of part, uh, the participants uh, of, uh, of our uh, survey. So one possible answer to this challenge is to introduce more local biodiversity preservation during participation process. So one can wonder what kind of specific arrangement could be done to curb extension of nature experience during participation process, participatory process. And this question led us to ask during our survey, According to you, how should we do to better consider local biodiversity during participatory process? According to the 109 participants, participatory pedagogy, which is defined here as a participatory sciences and field trip, is one of the best ways. So this result converges with the biodiversity conservation sciences conclusion. Indeed, they have already started to work on a way to recreate uh, nature experiences through participatory sciences. Uh, participatory sciences are a specific way to produce knowledge in which non-scientist actors, whether individuals or groups, participate actively and deliberately. So these sciences have several positive impacts, such as uh, reconnecting citizens with nature, um, collecting data on local species, or uh, in, uh, improvement of uh, social well-being. 
This leads us to propose a new hypothetical knowledge dynamic during a participatory process illustrated on this slide. Uh, as all those knowledge interoperate together, this new uh, knowledge called individual naturalistic knowledge would influence and expand others. Based on Zetlawi-Leger classification that I just showed uh, earlier, uh, we think that the best option is to promote a participatory process in which inhabitants are involved a lot and during the whole process. So to us, type A is the best option. To make this arrangement possible, and based on Chelson and Jigu list of actors, we propose to add biodiversity experts, especially participatory science facilitators. So now it's about experimenting this, pro this, this proposition, which is my, my PhD goal. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Amelie. I suppose Amelie is the first name, not the second. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, Amelie. Uh, I think that uh, I will now uh, give the floor to El Feituri uh, and we'll have time to discuss later. I just want to uh, once again, uh, you know, please uh, be as quick as possible. It's not easy for me to intervene uh, online. This is <laughs> one of the uh, you know, advantages or disadvantages of now of online sessions. Please, if you can be around 12, 13 minutes so that we can have some time to talk later. Uh, All right, can you see my screen? All good, thanks so much. Yes, uh, yes, thank yes. Great. Uh, thank you to Participatory Lab uh, for the opportunity to present today um, and to talk about um, uh, different models of uh, participatory uh, planning. Uh, my name is Neda El Fituri. I'm from Benghazi, Libya. Uh, I'm an architect, urban designer, and writer. Um, I'm currently based in London um, as public, the part of the public practice uh, program. Uh, but I've done quite a lot of uh, research and consultancy work in Libya. Um, and most recently, there's been this trend or a shift towards including participation in a lot of the new um, new projects and, and interventions. Um, so I'm going to share uh, two different models, uh, both of which I've worked on uh, in different capacities, uh, and what are the lessons that we can take away from them. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of the Libyan context, um, I'm sure you've heard the name Libya a lot in the news. Uh, you probably see lots of images of war and destruction and so on. Um, and the country has been in sort of this um, process of transition since 2011 after the revolution um, and civil war. Uh, and so within this context, a lot is actually happening inside of the country. And I think because Libya is such a black box <laughs> of information, it's very difficult um, to, to kind of learn what's going on in the country. Uh, I think there's actually a lot of really interesting lessons because so many new things are being piloted um, in the expanding uh, cities today. Uh, like many countries in Africa, uh, Libya is experiencing the rapid growth of its urban areas. Um, of course, this is happening within the context of increased fragility, fragility um, in the context of, of armed conflict, uh, but it is still a process that is happening. Uh, big cities are getting bigger. We're seeing a lot of internal migration um, due to uh, economic interests, due to internal displacement and so on. Um, and this is of course creating a huge pressure on infrastructure. It's creating a huge um, pressure on services. And given that our public institutions are still relatively new, uh, many of them were newly created after, after 2011, um, these institutions are still relatively weak. So what we've begun to see uh, in the past 10 years is an increased role of international organizations, UN agencies, and local civil society organizations to fill in governance and planning gap and try to, try to provide services that people need um, who are living in, in urban areas. Um, and increasingly, the agenda is starting to, um, we're starting to see more, um, more uh, pushing towards participatory models of, of, of implementing these projects. 
Um, we had a chat before the session began about how a lot of these um, approaches are very much symbolic. They're, they're purely tick box, tick, tick box exercises, um, which doesn't actually uh, promote um, active or genuine engagement, but rather just as a show to say, well, you know, we presented this idea to people. Um, so I think one of the biggest issues we are facing in Libya today is the fact that no one is really defining what participation means in the Libyan context. And I think that's something um, I think that's something that we don't have a conversation about enough as planners. Um, participation looks different in different places. Um, the, the, the overall goals and concepts could be the same, but then what it actually looks like on the ground is something that needs to be defined. And what I'm seeing a lot is um, international organizations taking models from Europe and trying to apply them to a context which does not even have, in many cases, the infrastructure for the, those kind of models. Um, so I'm going to share with you two examples of participation, which I thought were quite, um, uh, quite successful. Um, one was led from a municipality point of view and one from a civil society, um, civil society led project. Um, and the lessons that can be gleaned from, from these uh, contexts. Uh, the first is uh, the um, a project for a public park in the neighborhood of Alithi in Benghazi. Benghazi is the second largest city in Libya. And many neighborhoods in Benghazi um, witnessed widespread uh, destruction during the uh, war of 2014. Um, one of the areas that was affected was this area, Alithi. Um, and there were many projects to try and help reconstruct the area, to promote recovery, uh, to um, encourage people to come and move back to the area. Um, and one of the projects was um, a proposal by a local organization in the area uh, to, to build a park. It was kind of a... Um, uh, came out of left field <laughs> um, in the sense that, you know, people, when they think of reconstruction, they don't think of building a park. They think of, you know, um, repairing homes, repairing schools. But the organization said that one of the things that the, or the, the area lacked uh, even before the conflict was the lack of, of open public space where kids could play. So they chose a, um, a site uh, in front of uh, one of the local public schools, um, it's just, a, as you can see here, a, a strip of land. It, it's actually quite bigger than it looks. Um, and they um, proposed to an international organization uh, who was providing funding to build the park here. And I was brought onto this project as, a, 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 as an architect just to provide the preliminary design. Um, what's unique about this project it was, is that it's a woman-led organization. Um, and I think a lot of what we see in Libya today is that women are often restricted from uh, political participation, women and youth, and we see them dominating the civil society space. So it's the place where their, their voices are the loudest and where they're able to do the most. So this was a woman-led organization um, who were coordinating with uh, the local council, the municipality, working with the, the international organization for funding. Um, the project was supposed to start in uh, 2020, but due to COVID, of course, things were delayed. There was also issues with the budget because the project kept getting bigger. Um, this is uh, uh, an idea of the preliminary design we proposed. So we wanted a space for children, but we also wanted a space for um, older people to be able to sit, uh, to enjoy the space, as well as providing a sports court um, for, for kids to play, to play sports. Um, because it was an uh, a local organization, they were easily able to mobilize the network that they had in the area. Um, so able to get people on board with the project, um, to, to contribute what they could, um, to, to covering the budget deficit essentially, um, getting uh, utilizing their existing network of different suppliers, different companies to come in and help um, contribute to the project. Um, and of course, one of the things they had to do constantly was to negotiate with different uh, stakeholders. So they had to talk to the general company for electricity about providing infrastructure for lighting. They had to talk to um, the public office for uh, maintenance of green spaces to include this as, um, as a designated green space. So there was a lot of effort on the part of the, of the uh, local CSO to, to get everyone involved in this, um, in this design and in this implementation. Um, as I mentioned, there was a deficit in the budget because the project kept getting bigger. Um, and a lot of the time, they just managed to do things through their own volunteer work, either uh, mobilizing residents, mobilizing their own team members um, to cover what the budget couldn't. Um, and of course, because of COVID, but also some of these other issues, it took a much longer time to implement than what would normally be um, common for a, a public park project. Um, and this is pictures of, of the park. It was built uh, and it was opened uh, a few months ago. Um, you can see here pictures of the volunteers working on just 
you planting trees, painting sidewalk, um, and providing just additional additional um, uh, assistance to to make this park a reality. Um, and it was really a project that they adopted, that they really felt very passionately about. Um, I passed by the other day and I saw kids playing, um, playing there, they had left school. And so, I mean, you could see, you could see the fruit of their labor really very much showing in, in, in this project. Um, the other example I want to show you, um, and I know I'm running out of time, but so I'll be quick, um, is, uh, the creation of a public park in a town called Marada. Marada is a desert town, um, uh, located in an oasis. Um, it's a remote town. So they were not directly um, impacted by the conflict in other cities in Libya, but they were indirectly impacted by just the instability, by lack of services, lack of, of financing for different projects. Um, and one of the issues that this town faces is that there's really no public space. The town grew up very organically around the oasis, um, but in terms of planning, in terms of formal processes, there hasn't been much. Um, and so, of course, one of the, the victims of, of this kind of organic growth is, um, is designated green space, especially for children. Uh, and so an INGO um, uh, became involved in, in supporting several smaller uh, municipalities in Libya, and they proposed uh, funding for a public park in, um, in this town. And of course, like I mentioned before, uh, participation became this important um, thread to, to, um, to include in all different projects. Um, so I was brought in as a consultant to this project to kind of help pilot this um, participatory project. Um, the municipality um, was a partner with the international organization, so there was buy-in from them from the very, very beginning. And of course, it was much more of a formal process um, rather than what we saw in the previous example. Um, the municipality helped with selecting the, uh, a good site. They helped um, with uh, defining facilitators. We trained the facilitators to help give the co-design workshops. Um, and we also utilized social media to kind of increase increase awareness about this project to get people to give their feedback through different mediums. Um, because uh, the project happened uh, during during the second wave of COVID in Libya, it was very difficult for us to be able to move or to go to the different places. So we adopted a hybrid approach of part of the part of the the participation was done online, part of it was done in person, part of it was mixed. Um, and we also utilized an iter uh, iterative process. So it wasn't a matter of getting people's feedback and then proposing a design, but rather we did a needs assessment. We spoke to different residents. We had surveys uh, to understand what were some of the, the main needs for this park. From there, we worked the architects to create a preliminary design. And then we, uh, we organized co-design workshops. So showing the, um, the, the residents the initial design and asking them to make any changes, to propose any solutions to issues. Um, and from there, we worked on the final design. So there was a lot of going back and forth, which was actually, I think, quite um, quite helpful uh, to 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 capture all the nuances of of the local community. Um, and of course, because the town is quite conservative, um, and we were worried that if we had if we did just a series of open workshops, that the woman might not be as vocal um, in some of these workshops. And so what we did was to make sure that we were hearing the voices of of um, more marginalized groups. We had specific workshops just for women. We had specific workshops just for young people. And then we had an open day where everyone could come. So hearing the voices of men, but also giving women who wanted to, to take part a chance as well. And we were quite surprised to see that actually quite a lot of women, quite a lot of young people did come to the open day as well, in addition to the specific days we did for them. Um, and here we utilize different methods of design. So we used stickers, we used maps, we tried to incentivize participation of, of uh, the students by giving them awards um, and then capturing all of these different um, feedback and putting them into the final proposal, which looks like this. Um, of course, this project is different from the one that we've seen uh, with, um, with Alethi uh, and the civil society led approach in the sense that the municipality was helping to lead this participatory process. So of course it had this level of legitimacy or authority. It was of course much easier to, to get services um, created for this park. Uh, this is just a, um, a 3D uh, or a, sorry, a rendered image, um, a CGI image. The actual park is, is under construction right now. But it was much easier to kind of get services um, put in for this, quicker. this project. Amada, sorry to interrupt you. you. You need to go to the conclusions. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, 
um, it was, uh, it was, the project was done much faster. Like I said, it took uh, a few months for, for things to, to, to be finalized. But of course, it was a much more rigid process. Um, there was limited fl flexibility. So if there was an issue, of course, with the budget and, you know, we had to cut out a lot of things. Um, and of course, residents were a bit cautious. They were a bit skeptical. Um, and that's kind of the main, so the main conclusion I have is just um, to show that the, diff the different approaches both have positive and negative aspects to it. With the civil society approach, you definitely have more community buy-in. You definitely are able to be flexible around the project plan. Um, and there's definitely a stronger sense of ownership. Whereas with the municipal project, while it's more formal and more legitimate, that flexibility really doesn't um, exist. And the sense of ownership is still a bit hesitant. Apologies for taking too much time and thank you. Okay, Nada, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I had uh, this difficult role. Uh, I think Panayotis is next. Uh, I will give you the floor right away and we'll get back. With uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to check if my connection is good and if you can hear me clearly. That's perfect. Yes, we can hear uh, you. We can hear you. Perfect. We'll share my screen now. Um, uh, so, I will be talking about a practical project. My name is uh, Panayos Anetakis. My background is in architecture, uh, but I haven't really practiced this ever or an, an academic perspective. Uh, I work with NGOs in uh, creative partnerships between different organizations as, work, as well as working with civil society organizations to develop new projects. Uh, in March this year, I, uh, I applied to, to an open call for proposals by ECOHUB, an organization in Armenia. Uh, Nada, I want to say that I'm really thankful to be presenting after you because uh, uh, this is a case study of, uh, of, a, of a civil society based uh, project with all its uh, hindrances as well as uh, positive aspects. So let's go to Vanazor. Vanazor is the third most populous city, city in, in Armenia with a population of about 100,000 uh, residents. It's a shrinking city, uh, with, uh, losing about 10% of its population every 10 years due to the deindustrialization. De at the same time, there is a, a, an insurgence of youth. There is an art school, there is an architecture school, there is a film school. And because of rising rents in Vanador, in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, you see young people moving to Vanador. This is, I think, an interesting aspect. Uh, so let's go to the project. The project is uh, an international uh, development uh, uh, implemented by a local NGO. So the funding comes from the German Institute for Foreign Cultural Relations, which funded the, the workshops themselves, as well as 5,000 euros for hands-on project-based funding, which is a small amount of funds that allows us to start a small pilot. The uh, uh, project Panayodi, was... Yes? Sorry, Panayodi, maybe you, you put a little further away the microphone. Sometimes, is, uh, I don't know, the, the volume, I don't know for the, the, the Zoom uh, attendees, but here it's a little difficult sometimes. A little close, um, further the microphone away. How about now? Is this better? Perfect, sorry. Uh, so the project was implemented by uh, ECOHUB, which is a locally rooted women-led civil society organization founded in 2016, uh, that essentially uh, has a, a, an interesting track record of both working with international organizations and networks, as well as implementing local projects, not just in Vanadzor, but also in the surrounding municipalities. Uh, they have a strong collaboration with the Vanadzor municipality, which in this case agreed to support the project through participation uh, by uh, facilitating the participation of uh, two municipal employees that attend did all three workshops. In total, the three workshops engaged uh, 30 people, out of which 10 people engaged in all three workshops. Participants included university students, local artists, municipality employees from both the Vanazor municipality and neighborhood municipalities, as well as youth workers and civil society representatives. Um, so a, a brief timeline, the, the three workshops took place in uh, April, May and then July. Uh, uh, we'll go into more detail on, the, on each workshop. Uh, on the top line, we see some key points of the municipality. So we saw the municipality uh, through the process engaged more with the process, facility, facility with cleaning, uh, as well as uh, uh, engaged further with participation. So uh, in the first so workshop, I, hello? I think, I think that we cannot hear your, uh, you cannot see your presentation. I don't know. Ah, I'm are, sorry. We, we, just, we just see the first slide. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. You have, you have to share the screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's uh, right now. Are you in workshop number one? Uh, what uh, do you see now? We, now, now we're okay. We we can see the first workshop, the activities, outcomes, the slide. That's right. I'm think sorry it's for the, the same. Okay. Things. Oh yeah, you can continue. Uh, so the objective of the first workshop was uh, an introduction into participatory community development uh, to the participants. So for that, we arranged a series of uh, meetings online with uh, initiatives from uh, around Europe, mainly in Greece. Uh, Actors of Urban Change, a pan-European initiative, the Kipseli Market in Athens, the Citizen Lab, which is a toolbox, as well as Basis, which is an interesting space in, uh, in South Tyrol. 
Then we looked into different tools and platforms, such as the city toolbox, the decision platform as a way of, of uh, participatory budgeting and participatory decision making, as well as tools from Place Making Europe. And then we looked into some interesting practices of, uh, of uh, built examples, such as projects by uh, the Atelier d'Architecture de, de, de in Paris, uh, Commons and Residency, a project in Thessaloniki, the Dendry project, a participatory planting project, and uh, uh, the Pocket Park on Zvolo neighborhood. Uh, we had a meeting with the municipality where the participants presented their uh, their objectives to the mayor, and we connected with Amalia Zepu, the former vice mayor of the city of Athens for civil society, who described the impact that participatory processes had on the uh, on, munis on developing municipal buildings. Then towards the end, after having uh, had a first uh, understanding of specific tools, we went to, into thematic walks. Uh, and uh, the, the groups mapped uh, places of interest, such as abandoned buildings and underused public space. The key outcome was the, uh, um, the, uh, the identification of a space of intervention, which is the underpass that you see in the bottom right. Now I will try to show, share a video. In case it doesn't show, let me know because I will share a different presentation. Uh, I hope that the technology will be your friend. Uh, the underpass was uh, designed in uh, uh, the 1960s, and uh, is, let me know if you can see the video. Uh, can you see the video? Is, can someone confirm? Yes, perfect. So the underpass was designed in the 1960s and uh, was part of a main route connecting uh, two cultural venues, the municipal theater and the, the, and the cinema. Right now, the cinema is defunct. Uh, the municipal theater still is, is operational. As you can see, the underpass is in very bad condition. And to give you an example, this uh, video was, uh, uh, was, uh, was filmed after an initial cleanup by the municipality. So this is, there has been some, uh, uh, some improvement. And it has some very interesting attributes. The two sides of it form two public squares which, as you see in this video, are quite protected from the road, uh, are shady. But as you see, no one is actually using the, the underpass. People are avoiding it, and no one is, uh, is crossing it. Of course, underpasses are not the most up-to-date uh, uh, way of, um, uh, of connecting to bits. But nonetheless, this is existing, so there is a scope for, uh, for, for, for making something out of it. Uh, I will go forward a bit. So this is the other side of it. So you see uh, the, the long pedestrian street, and, and again, you see that this use of these uh, little, you know, created public squares that have a lot of potential to uh, be turned into community spaces. I will fast forward just to save time. So now we'll go on the other side again, just to get get, get an attention. So through um, through this process, uh, the uh, the people involved decided that this could be an interesting uh, cultural space. So, so this is essentially by revitalizing the underpass, by making it accessible again, it would become a space that. If, if, if it's not used as an underpass itself, as, an, as, as a pedestrian infrastructure, it could be used as a cultural space for open air exhibitions, uh, community meetings, uh, as well as uh, a common space in, 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 the, in the locality. Um, I think we got a good understanding of what that space is and, and its current uh, situation, its current use. So I will move back to the presentation. Which I have to find. I don't know if you can see the presentation. Uh, what about now? Thank yeah. you. Uh, sorry for the all, all the technical difficulties. The second workshop which took, pla which took, pla which took place in, uh, a, at the end of May, a month uh, later, we delved more into ideation. So uh, we had uh, a two hour long workshop with, with Vivian Dumpa from Placemaking Europe and Stipo, who introduced us to some uh, tools about placemaking, uh, as well as ways of engagement with the local community. Uh, using these tools, we visited the underpass again as a team and started collecting material, speaking to neighbors, uh, speaking to uh, shopkeepers, uh, understanding how it was used and essentially uh, understanding the context. In addition, we communicated to the neighbors and put up posters about a community meeting that was to be organized in the puppet theater owned by the municipality, uh, which was next door. Um, the community meeting took, uh, in the community meeting, the participants presented uh, their objective, which was to revitalize the underpass, and present, presented the material that was, uh, uh, that was collected. The meeting was attended by, by 20 people, and it was very interesting because uh, there was a lot of input from local residents about their, 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 uh, how they remembered the space. And we were very lucky to have with us uh, Tigran. Tigran was the craftsman that uh, had created the mosaic that you might, that you might have seen in the video. Uh, so there was a, a, it was an interesting point of connection of the neighborhood where memories of what uh, of, a, of, a, of a space that was now um, completely neglected came back to life. Uh, this allowed us to essentially get a, a better uh, understanding and connection with uh, what was happening in the area. Uh, so between the second and third workshop, which took place in July, um, uh, through uh, through uh, engaging the municipality, 
uh, uh, resources such as cleaning uh, took place in the uh, in the underpass. At this point, I think it's key to say that the participation of municipal employees into the process uh, was fundamental, not just for uh, keeping the municipality engaged, but because they also offered the knowledge of how to uh, how to navigate and negotiate complicated structures within municipality. They knew who to talk to, they knew who to call, they knew which door to knock, and that was very important in the process of being able to uh, motivate the municipality. So in the third and final workshop, um, uh, we tried to evaluate the process so far. Um, of course, the process has not been a complete success. There's a lot of issues and a lot of uh, challenges that have been identified uh, as next steps. One, one uh, aspect is engagement, that essentially through this process, there was an engagement of, of about uh, 10 people uh, overall. Uh, and in some way, one could say that maybe this was not representative of uh, the wider community as it could have been. Uh, the other aspect was that uh, uh, there was a, a relatively short term uh, of, of, uh, of, of the project uh, cycle. And once the project was finished, uh, which was in July, uh, it meant that participation fell. So uh, a question that, that, that arose is how do you maintain interest uh, of a process when there is no facility present and when this, the initiative has not been self-organized, but in some way bottom up, uh, no, sorry, top down by an NGO, as this was the case. So I think for me, this was one of the main uh, observations, essentially, how can we engage the community uh, further? Um, uh, but at the same time, the community meeting was uh, uh, was uh, uh, was successful, and it led us to organize a third meet uh, a third meeting that uh, um, uh, a third meeting that uh, with, uh, with 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 a larger group, uh, including people from from surrounding cities, that led to some interest by further people. I'm sorry, wrapping up. I'm sorry for time. Uh, so uh, a, a key concrete outcome of this was that in August there was an MOU signed between the municipality of Anadzor and EcoHub on uh, and on acknowledging that participatory processes uh, are uh, beneficial for uh, for the community. Uh, the three highlighted points we think are quite important because it opens a way for uh, more municipal understanding in uh, engaging uh, uh, into participatory process, processes in designing future space. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a brief note, a lot of design of public space is done in an extremely top-down approach and it, it usually involves just pouring large quantities of concrete on all public squares. Um, so what happens now? So construction work has begun and, and there is an updating of the physical infrastructure. But what's next? What happens next is to essentially try to keep, try to find a way to keep the community engaged in order to start uh, involving cultural programming in the updated space. That means organizing community bazaars, screenings, photography exhibitions. But of course, all this will have to do with how the NGO will continue to engage in that process. Uh, as a final uh, observation, um, for that to happen, there will need to be continuous engagement of a key group of people that uh, takes on the uh, that takes on uh, coordination and uh, of a group that uh, takes care of this space. Essentially, how this space is adopted. Uh, that is potentially one of the hindrances and, and issues when such a project is essentially done from a top-down approach, uh, because it doesn't come come from a self-organized manner that usually leads to an organic process of uh, loving a space. I will stop now, and I'm really and, and I'm looking forward to dialogue afterwards on this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Panagioti, and uh, thank you even more for being <laughs> right in, uh, uh, in the time frame. Uh, I think Jose, you can uh, take the floor, and uh, I, I think that it will somehow. Uh, you know, complete, uh, you know, the different images of different experience and different experiences from uh, all around the world and uh, Europe, especially, and uh, we'll have a time, short time to talk later on the different experiences and lessons. Yes, well, thank you. Yeah, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. It was, well, first of all, great three presentations. Uh, and, and it was very interesting because they are touching a lot of points that, that I will bring to discussion also. Uh, first of all, to say that this presentation is a part of a group of the University of Aveiro, a group of researchers, myself, Katarina, Janaina, Isabella, Gilles, and Desiree. Uh, well, this, we are a group of researching on participatory process and planning. And we are presenting this case of Maya, which is a municipality close to the city of Oporto in the north of Portugal. Uh, of course, let me, I will try to be brief, but I, would, it's, I think it's important to, to, to explain the context that we are living so we can understand why this 
these efforts to involve citizens are important. First of all, we are living a very hard and, and severe environmental crisis. Uh, the IPCC report uh, called attention to the global uh, the global crisis, the, the increase of temperature, and how to try to avoid. And nevertheless, uh, never. And, um, and after the debate that has been done, the COP26 uh, conference, as you know, it was real far from, from what we desired in terms of the goals that were obtained in, in the terms of the conclusion. So we are facing a severe crisis, but the decision makers and politicians, they are not acting as they should. So this is quite a contradictor a contradiction between what is the reality and what we need to, to, to do. And the same, we are, the same type of problems we are uh, dealing when we talk about the social and the political uh, context. We are living in a world with a very strong social inequalities with a spatial uh, impact in terms of the fragmentation, in terms of problems of segregation and gentrification and the loss of the sense of, of the commons, of what do we, uh, we, do we have as a collective. Um, and like Harari says, we are uh, in a moment where cities are, are no longer the heroes of the future. So this puts us to, to change and to have different approaches when re related with planning. And the planning itself is having also a lot of problems related with the traditional approach with land use process, with the very bureaucratic uh, and non-explicit uh, notion of collective interest. And the participation that we have been talking, uh, we must also criticize the way the, it is being used. A lot of words have, that the previous presentations have mentioned the idea of um, to be non-genuine or to be a simulacrum. Um, and of course, uh, Nissen uh, refers to the, the idea of the political legitimization of the buzzword agendas and, and, and the participation in a lot of issues, especially regarding sustainability, has been, uh, has been done this, the greenwashing and other uh, ways of putting uh, an, an artificial idea of of, of uh, civic involvement in terms of these green uh, topics. And also Flyberg talks about the idea of the, to force uh, consensus or the idea of to force consensus uh, and, and a, as a way to hide some, some of the political power struggles. So this is important that planning and participation should be done in a different way. And that's what why we, uh, in Portugal uh, and looking to the participative participation and to the planning practices where these, these issues have not been clear uh, defined and identified. Local administrations, they don't encourage citizen involvement. And we, uh, as Flyger also mentioned, this creates a problem of legitimacy and of responsibility. So, there are a lot of new, uh, new projects and uh, uh, Tiago Saraiva was uh, in this conference also, he is part of the BIPZIP and the Healthy Neighborhoods program, which are two new or two important uh, participatory efforts to bring citizens to, to these uh, local issues debate. Um, so the idea of looking at planning, at plans as an opportunity to change uh, the, their agendas, their ways of involving citizens. And this brought us the opportunity as a research group to call attention to the micro dimensions of participation. So it's very important, the concepts and the theories, but it's very, very important. How do we translate them into actions? And my municipality was an opportunity to do that because first of all, we had the chance to work with, uh, with um, uh, decision makers and a lot of a group of technicians who understood what the need we have to change when we talk about the method issue. 
as uh, the, some of the presentations have uh, claimed, participation is in most of the cases uh, an opportunity to show uh, decisions that are already made and to ask opinions. What we tried to, to bring to this was an idea of uh, involving citizens from the, the, the zero moment, from the beginning till the end of the plan. So in most of the, more or less, we intend to have a method where each step of the plan must be developed with the citizens. And for sure, it's important to clarify the three or four steps which for us are crucial. First of all, the expectations, then how can we involve citizens in building their own uh, diagnostic of, of reality to make the proposals and then to, uh, to test them, uh, to experiment them in, in some very technical actions and very small technical actions. So briefly, the expectations and the discussion about the expectations is a crucial issue because it's important to have political consensus about the importance of participation. And we had these meetings with, as you can see, with, uh, with the decision makers at the parish uh, and also at the municipal level. Um, they were also imp important to, uh, to help us to bring citizens and to involve citizens. And finally, to focus on the idea of uh, the debate should be centered on collective interests, not on specific individual discussions and interests, but on the uh, collective agendas. And it, in the beginning of the plan, what we did was not only to have a look and to understand the reality, but also to understand the context. And Maya, uh, although it's a municipality in the metropolitan area of Oporto, has a very important rural context so we brought uh, researchers and lecture from universities to talk about environmental, economic, and mobility issues, and to show how the world and the global discussions can be important to define the local agenda. Secondly, we begin to understand how we could bring and to have a, a, a powerful and interesting uh, uh, discussion. So the round tables are crucial because the round tables are we assure with the round table that people are at the same level. Uh, as uh, Amelie said, we, we brought different kinds of knowledge, the technicians, the citizens and the activists, they are all at the same time at the same level and they speak the same and all speak and all the, the same time. So there is not a, a prevalent uh, member that uh, the, the auditorium uh, model uh, usually creates. At the same time, we understood that it's important for a municipality that is uh, in a very strong urbanizing process to understand the history, the collective memory. So we asked citizens to bring to the, to the sessions their memories, their collective memories in, for, in terms of uh, old photographs or uh, their stories. And what we um, brought or what we did was uh, a recovery of this collective memory that is lost. And sometimes these stories, they are very important, but, but they use, they help us to bring, to build new narratives about the future, focus and uh, strength and, and, and follow and, and, and using these, uh, these ideas. And that were mapped uh, in this uh, collective memories map that Gilles Moreira which is here listening as produced. As you can see, these are uh, a, a way of organizing the ideas, the, the, the suggestions, the histories about the, the, this, these communities. And they, are, they were very, very inspiring in terms of the strategy that was built. Uh, at, at the same time, this is important because it brings us the idea of the sense of community the way we have to organize and, and care, take care of the collective life. Um, but people also share their opinions about the positive and negative aspects. So we list them carefully. The, our role was really to help people, help citizens to uh, know how to talk and to share their opinions in respecting the difference of opinions and respecting the different uh, perceptions and to register that and to give back in terms of newsletters that were sent after each phase. 
we have we use a lot of uh, techniques uh, lotus flower these co collective memory maps um, and they were very important because as you can see in these images that this was developed during one one year and a half people came and there was a a strong concern about the number of persons participating. As you can see, people were uh, appeared in two or three meetings during this period to give uh, their opinions. And what was really amazing this was the, the technical value of their opinions. They are non-technical, they are citizens, but nevertheless, they give us uh, proposals and, 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 and give us ideas about proposals and actions that are pretty much aligned with the, the strategy that the technicians of the municipality made. So during this process, we had more than 50 meetings uh, with more uh, than 100 and 500 participants, especially uh, men and uh, middle age. And uh, nevertheless, they were generally interested in the, in the collective interest. They are not what well, they were not there to defend or to protect their own uh, land use uh, interest or so. And they uh, offered a lot of proposals. You can see more than 1000 proposals that then were organized in a more systematic way in 144 proposals. And then we created and uh, Nada talked about this the idea of experimenting the, pro the proposals. So the pro saying, yes, I'm, I'm ending. You have, you have to be a little quicker. Sorry about that. One minute, one minute to end. So this is just the the way that uh, we organize events that people uh, experiment in the field, their ideas, their proposals, their projects, their their dreams about their, their place. And they, they could understand the difficulties uh, that uh, decision makers and technicians have to, to face. So finally, two major uh, um, uh, learnings. First, first of all, it is very important uh, that we try to focus on the collective interest. And this is also, this is an important pedagogic effort to bring uh, through their collective memories and their knowledge to bring a new knowledge that is a narrative that can be very useful to, uh, to, to envision the future, but based on their understandings and their ideas. And this was a very important uh, frame that we uh, articulate the technical and civic and institutional uh, perspectives. Of course, this is there's problems related with costs and times. Finally, what are the recommendations that we would like to leave? First of all, to be uh, audacious re regarding with the methodology to use. We have to strengthen the connections between the different planning teams of the municipality, and finally, with the different types of planning instruments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jose, and uh, thanks uh, everybody for, uh, for their presentations. Panayoti Nada and uh, Amelie or um, the, the Cure, the first and the second. Uh, I would like to ask uh, if uh, anybody from the crowd or uh, from the Zoom uh, would like to come. Okay. Uh, you have to the microphone, of course. I think uh, it, it was one of the fascinating sessions, all these different case studies. I hope that. Thank you very much. It was really interesting in the programs. Uh, but my question is mainly to Mrs. Um, Jose. Uh, the recovery of collective memory is quite an interesting concept. How that your experience on the project, do you find a conflict to, to, to recollect the, the memory or agreement between an understanding between the citizens? What was the results for that? Shall we collect all the questions and answer in the end? Yes, yes, I think it's better to it's do better, like yeah. that way. Uh, is there anybody else from, from the crowd or from uh, Zoom? Otherwise, I would, I would like to, to make a comment slash uh, question uh, for all the four of you. And I think it's the obvious question. 
uh, I would like you to share your thoughts on the, the different situations of your four different case studies. And uh, it seems that it's always easy to say that, you know, the context of every country is different. Uh, but in some cases, it seems like we are facing similar challenges, even though in a, whole, in a totally different framework. Obviously, you cannot compare France or Portugal, even between the, them, but I mean, in comparison to Libya or to Armenia, they are uh, totally different things. But it seems that uh, some questions remain similar, some challenges and problems. So I would like to, to share your thoughts on these different, uh, you know, similarities and differences uh, among these case studies. And uh, the second thing that I would, uh, I would like to keep uh, is, uh, and I, I would like you to, to, to discuss it with you, is the obvious difficulty of the COVID period. Uh, all of us who are working in uh, participatory projects, we face the, the same difficulties in the last two, one and a half year. Um, it's obvious to say that uh, nothing is the same. You cannot do your uh, meetings the same way as you did. I, I saw Nada in some, some very difficult things that someone was drawing and someone was from a screen and don't know how exactly you deal you dealt with it. But uh, it seems that uh, in some cases we found a, a way, not the best way, not uh, an equally participatory way, obviously. And uh, we have new exclusions and... Uh, a lot of difficulties, but in a way, some in some cases, uh, the new tools. I don't want you, of course, to emphasize on the tools. I mean, it's not a discussion about which digital tool or not, if it's, but as how, you know, this new period and that seems to be a little uh, yeah. not permanent, but it won't be that temporary as it seems. So I would like you to comment on that. And I don't know if there isn't any other comment or question, I think I will give you for a short uh, comment as your closing and answer session. We can start uh, the same way we, we did it before. Uh, so Amelie, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so about uh, similar uh, and the differences, um, I, I noticed that uh, the presentation of uh, Muta Muta GC, I don't know <laughs> if I if I say it right. Uh, Jose. Jose. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, there is a, a well in Paris and and what you do you, you just shown about the Portugal. Uh, I see some similarities with the um, uh, with the approach and with the the fact that uh, that very uh, with the the current uh, crisis environmental crisis there is a need to uh, a new approach. Uh, of uh, a new method to 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 make uh, a better way to to create a better participation process, uh, more uh, 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 more um, uh, linked to to more related to 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 crisis uh, issues, uh, environmental crisis issues, and uh, I think that's uh, one point that we. Uh, before this, uh, had um, we, but that's that's a, a point yet that we 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 all uh, kind of uh, have said if, according to several issues, but what's crisis issues um, or societies issues, d d different um, several societies issues, but there is a need uh, to adapt participatory process according to to a specific situation. And uh, I think that's uh, something that we all said in different ways. That's how I, 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 I well, I felt it. And, um, and I believe that there is a need of, uh, of new methods, uh, uh, perhaps more, more local methods, uh, several methods to integrate uh, participatory um, inhabitants in, uh, in those process. So that's what I will, um, I, I will say. 
and um, and I saw well a lot of things have been said of course and uh, on on several so what I said on several topics and um, and I I the one point that uh, there is differences uh, uh, di method differences uh, in uh, in um, in uh, in the the how to recognize in the profile of inhabitants uh, according to to situation. Uh, I saw that uh, for in Portugal it was a uh, men uh, middle age, uh, if I remember it well, and uh, and in Libya it was a uh, uh, young people and uh, and and female that uh, participates uh, also a lot, even when there were all the public uh, uh, in in meetings, and so I think that in France we don't have always the same profile. It is a uh, sometimes uh, uh, oldest people who came or younger, but uh, it depends on also uh, society's issues and, uh, and society's realities and, and stuff. So I think that's quite, quite interesting uh, to, to, but I, I, what I feel is, is a really uh, a need to, to innovate in the, in the participatory process according to uh, several issues uh, uh, that we all are, are, we are all facing at this different uh, stage uh, and now, and about uh, well, it's quite related to so the COVID nineteen uh, difficulties. It has to be only you know ten seconds because you. All were right. Okay. The... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Sorry about that. Uh, I, but uh, I just you know don't want to uh, you know make the the rest of the uh, speakers uh, speak less. So I, I right. will give the floor to Nada. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm a no little. Problem. We are already a little late. So anyway. So Nada, the floor is yours. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about it. Um, I'd say probably the similarity that I've seen in all of our presentations is just this um, going back to the issue of collective community knowledge and community action um, and the power of, of, of knowledge among local communities to work on these projects. Um, that's definitely one of my biggest takeaways is just you need to do more than just symbolic, um, tokenistic, uh, uh, participatory um, participatory exercises because you're missing out on a lot of knowledge that can add so much more and enrich the projects. Um, in terms of the COVID-19 restrictions, um, in some ways it was really difficult, <laughs> especially getting people to use Zoom. Um, in other ways it was actually great because it allowed us to reach out to um, communities in very remote places that we wouldn't normally be able to, to visit, um, especially in the context of a conflict where mobility becomes a lot more limited. Um, the, the first um, the first example I showed, there was no, of course, um, online online work because Zoom was still a very new concept for a lot of people. Nobody understood how to do it. So everyone was doing things on the ground. By 2021 this year, where we did the project in Marada, um, everyone was using Zoom. At that point, everyone has become somewhat literate in online events. Um, so it's also been a lear learning curve as well for us. Um, and I'll just end there. Thank you. Panayoti. Very brief. Uh, so with regards to the similarities, I could see potential challenges in funding. Because very often, uh, participatory design, participatory planning are, uh, uh, are spearheading uh, in, uh, uh, spearheaded in uh, when it comes to uh, just as a pilot programs or as a methodologies to, to engage people. But when it comes to actual implementation of projects on a larger scale, uh, we're missing the, the step of scaling it up to a point where uh, decisions on public space on a larger scale are taken participatory. And there, I mean, some similarities between places, I don't know if that's the case in, in most places, that if we think about it, public infrastructure is something very expensive. And it's something that essentially whoever funds it will not let go in some way. And we see this in Greece, we see it in Armenia, we see it in, in most places in the sense that essentially that it's the potential to make money and you know, through corruption, for example, or through uh, awarding contracts where it's needed or using specific amounts of concrete or specific uh, types of street furniture is uh, so uh, present that to reach the point of you know, breaking through that to the point where essentially decisions are being able to be taken by through participatory processes, I think that's a, a, that's, I see this as a similarity of uh, a challenge or a gap that we have to uh, transcend. And that's, that's a governance issue, that's a corruption issue, that's a, that's a, that's a very complicated subject and it will take a long, long time. When it comes to COVID, um, 
I think that, uh, so in the case of Armenia, there was no restrictions. So essentially we had to, it was as if no, COVID was not there, which is quite weird for uh, us as facilitators. But uh, observing other groups and how they worked, I could see very interesting adaptations, both based on what Nada said, that essentially there was engagement on a different geographical perspective. So groups that were suddenly, uh, they were Athens-based, for example, suddenly engaged people from all over, all over the country. And then the other aspect is finding innovative ways to engage with people. And an interesting case was what uh, I think Mamayer presented yesterday in the, the NDRI project, where essentially through the limitation of a lot lockdown, having a walk, uh, coming up with a participatory mapping exercise based on the fact that you are in a lockdown, you can only walk around um, uh, close to your house, and then you map something locally, because that's what you can do. Uh, that's my key takeaways. I think this discussion will be very nice to, to, to keep it going, but uh, I think we have to keep it short. Thank you. Jose, your final so, remarks? Uh, well, I, 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 agree, I agree completely with my, with the colleagues related with the how the different cases are, they have a lot of similar similarities and, and the, the, the concern that we have with, the, with details. I think, I think this is, for me, it's, the micro details are crucial to assure that um, this is not just a, a tokenist approach to, to, particip to participation. Regarding collective memories, I, I think they are very important. First, of course, they are uh, a new uh, attempt to bring uh, a language that is common and easily uh, understood by everyone, because when you are speaking about your the place where you live and you talk about your memories, it, it has a, an effect that brings other kind other members or, or other types of members from from the audience. So it's a very powerful way of creating links between the between the groups. And then, of course, it's important because they they talk about. Uh, important things that they uh, they care about in in the past and in the, in, in most of the cases they lost in the in the present. So these are opportunities to to identify narratives of proposals or of or of uh, of uh, ideas that can be bring from 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 that past to the future. Finally, COVID COVID was a crucial problem and a, a crucial uh, issue related with the, the adaptation. But what is, was really amazing, and like Canada was, was saying, there was an, a, a, a very important learning process during these uh, two years of pandemia. So in, another, in, in, in Maya, but then in other places we are working, people adapt to use Zoom and to produce the same type of discussions online that they have done physically, which is really amazing. So we have to push citizens to be innovative and to uh, arrange new ways of involving them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, both the panelists and the attendees, both from Zoom and uh, physically. Uh, I am reminding you that all the presentations, uh, there will be the videos uh, eventually, I keep eventually, uh, uploaded uh, in our website, etc. So I'm, I'm very happy. You know, I'm sorry that we couldn't talk more, but I think that the conversation were, was very full and very nice. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, everyone uh, who wants to stay, either physically or through the Zoom chat, you know, the, the, the panelists will be, you know, ex expelled from panelists, <laughs> but uh, I can do that. Uh, you, we can continue. Uh, with the workshop uh, called uh, Athens as a Scenery, Visual Code, Comments and Methodology by Constantina Duca, Anastasia Carusi and Anna Vafiadou. Uh, give us five minutes or ten minutes to, you know, do the technical uh, stuff and uh, we'll get back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you in all, all over the world. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Another. I'm Elie Bye-bye. 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 Bye everyone.